I'm sure that uh, most sessions, maybe this is a, it's a stati statement of the obvious, but mo a lot of us probably have been talking, reflecting all day today and through the week, how things have changed since the last time we were all gathered for SOCAP 2019. And today, lucky to be here with Kwesi and Daniel, who I'll introduce in a minute, to really talk about the trends that were already in motion before 2019 for the private sector more broadly to step up and answer the call to help solve our largest societal and environmental pro um, problems. And since 2019 and all that's unfolded since then, we've just really seen those things accelerate. And large corporations are integrating purpose into everything that they do and into their businesses. And at the same time, seeing billions of dollars throw, flow through ESG funding and through um, impact venture capital. So where do those two things come together? That's what we're here to talk about today and brings us to our two guests. I'd first like to introduce Daniel. He's currently the managing director at Halcyon's Incubator, which focuses on supporting entrepreneurs and finding game-changing solutions to our most pressing problems. By helping social entrepreneurs transform ideas into scal scalable and sustainable ventures, the incubator acts as a catalyst for measurable social outcomes. Daniel also brings a perspective from lots of different points of view, the Fortune 500 lens from his role at the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth, from the investor perspective as the VP of Social Impact at BlackRock, and he served on the Council of Foreign Relations and is a Deloitte alum. I had to get that one in there. Um, and Daniel has a BA from NYU and a, and a Master's of Inter International Affairs from Columbia. Thank you for joining us today, Daniel. Thanks, Carrie. And I'm pleased to introduce my colleague and friend, Kwesi Mitchell, the first Chief Purpose Officer at Deloitte. Kwesi is responsible for leading our organization-wide strategy that powers Deloitte's commitment to purpose and drives broader impact for us, our clients, and our practitioners in the communities in which we live and work. With Kwesi's leadership, Deloitte has committed to 1.5 billion commitment over the next 10 years to address equity for those facing the greatest barriers to prosperity. Prior to being the purpose officer Deloitte, at Deloitte, Kwesi was the diversity, equity, and inclusion leader and the pro bono and social impact lead for Deloitte's 50,000 plus person, yes, 50,000 plus, um, consulting practice and served as the strategy op offering leader for Deloitte's government and public services practice. And my favorite part, which I was just saying, to round out things, Kwesi has a PhD in inorganic chemistry, of all things, from um, Northwestern University and an MBA from Drexel University. So thank you, Kwesi, for being here today. That was the hardest part, getting through the introductions. <laughs> <laughs> so Kwesi, maybe I'll start with you. Um, the statement of the obvious, all that's happened since 2019. How have you seen Deloitte and Deloitte's uh, clients' perspectives, attitudes, and beliefs change, and, and how is that showing up in the business today? Yeah, I think that there's a new level of intentionality with respect to how people address social impact. If you look at a lot of large organizations, historically there's always been this notion of pet projects, interesting areas that people are getting engaged, perhaps uh, some semblance of a strategy, as you know well, but not something that's cohesive and tied to the core. And what I'm seeing more and more organizations doing right now is tying different aspects of the work that they're doing to their business strategy. As you were just indicating with our 10-year aspiration, that's specifically baked into our long-term plan and in such a way that there's accountability around it on a year-by-year -year basis. And that didn't happen historically. And what we really observed when we were looking at our giving, our pro bono services, and our impact through the years was this kind of whiplash of like giving, where it's like some major incident would happen, like George Floyd, we turn around and we dedicate, you know, 10, 15 million dollars more worth of funding towards distinct causes, and then that would go away. It'd be a one-year commitment. Now you're seeing organizations that are being much more thoughtful as to a one-year commitment isn't gonna drive systemic change, right? Like we have to be thoughtful with respect to the way that we engage with distinct partners, have long-term commitments, are focused on distinct issues, and have an impact that is beyond a singular or at least two business cycles. 
And that's what you're seeing more and more from organizations of our size, which I think is well overdue and is a really good path forward. Great. And Daniel, from your varied perspective, both the Fortune 500, investor, and now nonprofit, how are you seeing this show up in the organizations that you work with? Yeah, it, it's very much in alignment with what Quasi just said. Um, it should be obvious that social impact, particularly a corporation, should be tied to the business model. Uh, and for us at Halcyon, that's the, exactly the kinds of companies that we, uh, that we support, but they're startups, right? They are building that into how they are operating from a business standpoint. I think corporates are actually have learned um, that in order to, for it to be sustained, similarly to for a startup, it needs to be tied towards uh, what are core business objectives. Um, and not the, the one-off, the, the specific um, interest of, of one person in leadership, but really what can we sustain? What are the unique value that we're bringing to any statement of purpose? Uh, and so that's been a real, sort of seeing that sort of play out for good and for ill um, in different roles. Uh, and also what drove me to, to want to be at Halcyon and to support organizations that are at their outset are really thinking about how to combine profit and purpose and have that as, as their revenue model scales, their impact scales. And often we've all heard that as part of this commitment and the new integration to business, partnership comes up as a big theme. Ecosystems, partnerships, we all know all the key phrases for that. But how do you get, how have both of you all seen getting beyond the handshake, the MOU, the commitment that Deloitte's made and others to really drive action? What, what's happening to really make those things move forward? Sure, I'll, I'll start. I mean, I, I think the the Halcyon and Deloitte relationship is actually a really good one to start. Um, we started this partnership eight years ago, and I was on the other side of that partnership. I was a, <laughs> a Deloitte consultant managing a pro, what we called then a pro bono relationship. Um, and Deloitte was a very different company at that point. It was perceived as you know one a one time engagement, um, and then we realized that there was actually really something here. Um, that there was a value that was certainly to our fellows, our entrepreneurs, that they were able to access this incredible resource. Um, and there was a value to Deloitte. Um, and it actually took us several uh, iterations to, to get the partnership right, and we're still continuing to evolve. Uh, but the lesson that I took away from there is that we started with something. Uh, we didn't say that we were going to change everything, but we knew what impact we wanted to have for the founders, and we iterated. And as we demonstrated value, both sides continue to invest more. Uh, and I think for me, that's the, the critical aspect of that partnership, being able to set some clear objectives uh, at the outset, not completely overthink everything and try to plan for every contingency, uh, but actually modify. You know, Some of the things that we initially started off with trying, we would do hackathons uh, and bring in you know, 200 delayed analysts at a time, which is great for the analysts <laughs> and not so great for our entrepreneurs. And we're like, okay, that didn't work for the entrepreneurs, so we're gonna try something different. Um, and it was great to have a partner who's willing to, um, to experiment and, and do that on both sides. And we built the relationship over that time, but it was really just a willingness to, to get in and get dirty and not focus you know, on some broad statement of, of, of a 10-year objective, but really like what's the work right in front of us. And I think to play off of that, with partnerships that I've found to be highly successful, clearly they're, they're sustained, um, but there's this understanding of what we as a firm do well and what the organization needs so that we can scale, right? Like you have this interaction where people have come in and they've talked to me and they've understood like, hey, I looked at some of your material online, such as your D&I transparency report. You have challenges here. This is where we think that we can be part of the solution. And guess what? it's not just funding that I'm looking for. I want a partner who's gonna help me bring in other people that we can convene around this issue. We wanna use your analytical skills to really produce thought-provoking pieces so we can bring other people in. And so the most like dynamic partners that we've had have also balanced in addition to that, this notion, and, and as you know, an organization of our size, like part of our, part of our impact is just engaging our people in some way, shape, or form. Yeah. And so our really sophisticated partners show up and say, here's some things that I can get hundreds of your people engaged in so they get an introduction and a feel for giving back to their communities. And oh, by the way, here's some infrastructure challenges that we have that we could use funding with respect to. And oh, by the way, here's a strategic problem that we have that we could use something such as a pro bono project and your thought partnership on. 
And when all of that comes together, you just find organizations that are so embedded and tied to us as a firm that that partnership just lasts for years and years. And to your point, you never quite get it fully right because organizations continue to change, but you end up with partners that are nimble, that know on a year by year basis, things ebb and flow and how to adjust on the fly. Great, that's super helpful and, and shifting when you describe that, it has many layers and complexities, which I well know at Deloitte as well. But as we shift and think about accountability and measurement, how you know ESG, uh, people have lots of opinions on that and heard there was some lively a day, a debate about that even today. But what are your perspectives on ESG, both for driving change more broadly, and then how does it help Deloitte and Healthion hold themselves accountable for these actions, for all of this new purpose work that's being integrated? I think it's all about accountability, right? The, and Carrie, you've heard me say before, when we announced our 10-year investment, I frequently said the reason that we announced that is so that we could be held accountable, right? Because no matter how much funding you give to a specific issue, it's never going to be enough to solve some of the systemic challenges that we have currently. So for me, like ESG is a risk management tool, it's a transparency tool, and we all just have to admit that is the data right? Are the outcomes ideal? Are there aspects of greenwashing? All of those things are in flux and will evolve. I don't think that it's necessarily something that we should just fundamentally walk away from. Yeah. I would agree that the accountability piece is, is key, and that's what I would focus on. Um, I, there was a debate, as you mentioned earlier today, about ESG, so I won't get into the specifics of, of the measures themselves. I do think for, for some of the early stage investing community, there's been a confusion that ESG has added um, that I'm not sure is super helpful, particularly as I work with, with founders and isn't always actually geared towards that sure. accountability. Mm -hmm. uh, so we get into these esoteric debates about how we measure ES and G, whether we're just looking at risk or we're looking at positive, positive measures as well. Um, and then I actually see some of folks doing you know, exactly the opposite of what I said before in terms of the, the business model. They start chasing things that they think are gonna fit within ESG. Um, because they're, they're saying, oh, there's trillions of dollars flowing, so we need to, to follow where the metrics are driving, and we don't know that the metrics are right. So I think the accountability is key. I think for uh, the entrepreneurs that I'm seeing, whether ESG is actually helping uh, that conversation, I think the jury's still out. And I, I do think that there's aspects of it that's helping the conversation, because we're having a different conversation. Yeah. Right, like, and that, that's what I'm always focused on, like, are we having a different conversation today than we had two, three weeks ago? And for people who've been doing, you know, and in this field as long as we've been, we've had some of the same conversations yearly for the last 10 to 15 years, right? So I do think that that progression of the discussion is beneficial, even if all of the other trappings associated with ESG aren't ideal. Great, and I think you're right. It's it's. I we heard we were talking about the debate that happened, and is there should there be an I that we're having that discussion at all? Is I think, you know, exactly that point, crazy. We wouldn't have been having that, you know, five years ago. Certainly not even two or three years ago. Yeah. So Daniel, oh, go ahead. I was going to say as long as we, and I think it's about making sure that we're focused on the accountability side yes. versus like how many more letters do we add? Yes, <laughs> yes, right. alphabet soup we don't want, that's for sure. And done a lot, I think, recently to reduce that across with the standard setters and things of that sort. So, Daniel, I'm interested in looking at kind of the other way we talked about Deloitte and, and the partnership that Deloitte has, but how are the entrepreneurs that you work with experiencing this reality and how is that helping them grow their business or not? Yeah, I mean, it's certainly something that's evolved. As I mentioned, that we, we started out, we tried different things, and really realized that we were also we were almost speaking different languages. And you know, I was a consultant at the time, try, in, in trying to train consultants to speak to startup founders when they're typically used to speaking to four, Fortune 500 companies or large government agencies. Um, and so the experience really, once we were able to get people speaking the same language uh, and having um, the ability for the Deloitte consultants to understand what are the kinds of challenges and sort of the decision fatigue that's involved for early stage founders. Uh, and then are they having the early stage founders understand what is the potential of this resource that they could use. And that's true for a great relationship with Deloitte. We have relationships um, with uh, legal pro bono support similarly. Um, and really helping them 
focus in on the decision at hand because I think so much for early stage founders, there's so many choices, right? There's so many ways that you could use this resource. Um, and it's often very overwhelming and, and lonely and making sure that this is an additive resource, not another sort of set of decision points that they have. Yeah. Um, so it's really been fantastic in the way that it's evolved. You know, we've moved from having just one touch point to having teams around each of the entrepreneurs. Um, and so the experience is now like one of the most uh, highly rated aspects of our program, which is fantastic. And again, it's about having a clear partnership and being able to tell a partner when things don't work. And you know, having been on the other side as a as a funder in the past, you know, sometimes folks that you're working with, because there is an asymmetry in that power dynamic, you don't feel like you can always make that um, that correction um, because you're you've got this access to this incredible resource, you don't want it to go away. So being able to have a partner that you can have a real conversation with um, is, is super important and has been the key to being able to evolve um, the, the experience so that it's in favor of the entrepreneur. And, and that's what I love about our relationship with Halcyon because it's, it is unfair to expect a founder to speak mm. and understand Deloitte. Like we're 150,000 people within our US firm. That founder should know what they're actually doing, they should not understand the nuances of some subunit within our organization that has the resources that they need. But Halcyon does, right, and can connect that particular conversation. So I think that that's the beauty of what I'm seeing more and more organizations starting to like edge towards is rather than working with some of the founders themselves that you have organizations like Halcyon that are ideal for doing that translation of, you know, kind of mitigating in some respects that power dynamic um, so that you have founders focus on what founders should know and then you have an organization like us know how to show up in a way that's beneficial rather than a resource strain because as you know like large organizations can be a resource strain if we show up with the wrong set of benefits and tools and things of that nature that we want to apply we're here to help <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah um, I'm going to ask one question, but I, I want to get y'all's questions that are coming through, but the iPad is not on the right place, so I'm going to ask somebody from backstage to come get the iPad when they can. Um, and meanwhile, we'll continue on, but um, interested in both of your perspectives, like what's been the most challenging thing in the journey over, I know the Purpose Office has been around for almost two years now, and then in your uh, tenure at Halcyon over the last year. What's been the most challenging thing that you've been faced with? Do you want to start? Yeah. Sure. Oh, so many. I, so this is a. I'm ten months into the journey, at, formally in this seat at Halcyon. Uh, obviously, I had the experience when I was at Deloitte. And honestly, the biggest thing for us as a nonprofit incubator has been making sure that you know, the resources match uh, our ambition, right? And I don't think that that should never um, be full, a gap that's fully closed because that. That would mean we weren't being ambitious enough. Um, but the opportunity is so vast and the understanding of the importance of investing in early stage impact driven entrepreneurs um, has evolved so much that we have so many different opportunities and so many different places that we could, could be working. Uh, so figuring out how we align all of that um, to, to really make sure we're doing our best um, by the entrepreneurs. We're never gonna be the biggest and that's really not our ambition, but to be the best and to be able to bring our partners along that journey. That's been, you know, kind of the, the evolution, the thing that I'm constantly thinking right. about over these 10 months in, in, in this job. I would say the hardest thing for me, um, stepping into this role and it, her, inheriting a portfolio that's not really a portfolio, right? Like inheriting a set of initiatives, activities, investments that are it's not even apples to oranges, but <laughs> apples and small cars, right? Like it's just been all over the place. And and to the point of, you know, I always laugh when people point out I'm a chemist by training. Like my my training is like you exert order over chaos. <laughs> and there's a certain level of chaos that you need to have within a portfolio to test things, to figure out what works, to vet new partners and things of that nature. So my, my hardest challenge has been like, what within that portfolio does not serve us well in comparison, or, and never will, in comparison to the things that are, what is in our portfolio that we haven't shown up with the right partner yet, mm. or haven't done that translation yet, or had the right leader lean in to really like maximize the outcome that we're trying to drive in our communities. 
and that's still something that I feel much better about now, but like that evolution is still a work in progress because my natural inclination is like, we do 10 things and 10 things only, and we're gonna have an impact on those 10 things. <laughs> And that's just not the way this works. Yeah, it's interesting because the, the thread that from what both of you said shows up so much in the work that we do with our clients as well. And we talk about it as the sprawl, you know, yep. and, and, and how do you rationalize how much of the sprawl is a good thing and gets engagement and activity? Where do you want the 10 things and what they are? And um, so I, it seems to be something that we're all struggling with is more and more happens and proliferates in companies. How do we make sort of sense of that chaos? Yeah. Um, I do have the iPad working, so it's good news now. So we'll go, so send your questions in, because I'm ready. Um, but the, one of the first questions was about working in communities, and how are, how are both the entrepreneurs and larger companies like Deloitte thinking about working in communities to help with both threats that are happening day to day, pandemics, you know, most immediate things, and solving for longer term systemic problems that have been there for a long time that are, are just now getting exacerbated. Yeah. So Daniel, do you, yeah. Do you want to start? Sure, yeah, I mean, so we've got a number of programs, some that are really you know, hyper-local, like a program that we focus on entrepreneurs coming from the DC metro area. Um, and even within our small ecosystem, we have to recognize we, the housing is set in a beautiful historic property in Georgetown, DC. Um, that's not the place where, that's not where the entrepreneurs who we are serving are coming from. Mm -hmm. uh, we sit in a beautiful building that was built by slaves um, and are working with entrepreneurs who are coming from Anacostia, which is one of the, the, uh, the neighborhoods where freed slaves moved to. Um, so for us, it's, you know, are we showing up in a way that we're meeting entrepreneurs where, they, literally where they are? Um, and also, are we working with the organizations that are already working in those communities to source those entrepreneurs to make sure that our everything that we're providing to them is contextualized and, and makes sense, um, and we have to do that across programs because we have you know super DC focused program, and we also have programs that focus on Middle East and North Africa or Sub-Saharan Africa, and so adjusting to each of those contexts is super mm. important, uh, and realizing that we don't have nearly all of the answers, and identifying who are the recruiting partners, who are the folks who actually know who the early stage entrepreneurs are. In those communities, uh, we know there's still lots of barriers to, to this work. Some of it's terminology. People don't know, you know, some you know, folks who don't know ed equity, and debt equity, <laughs> uh, debt and equities are even just breaking down language mm -hmm. um, so that we are doing our best to, to reach those entrepreneurs. Yeah, and, and for us, it's all about our communities. The vision that we've set with respect to the activities that we're doing within the firm um, in my role is that we would have our people be able to walk out of their front doors and see that there is an issue within their community and know that we're actively trying to engage on it and actively trying to really help the communities in which we live be um, more alleviate some of those challenges. And so the key things that we've learned and how we're trying to show up that's different in the past is A, by working with leaders that are more proximate to the issues that we're trying to solve, right? I mean. An organization of our size, it's very easy, as most with large organizations, and you've seen this through the years, who show up and they are masters in the universe and think that they can show up and solve things in such a way, and they create solutions for people that no one asked for, right? Like we show up with the banana and that's, they actually wanted again, a car, right? Yeah. <laughs> or something of that nature. And the other thing that's been really important for us as we've been thinking through this as well, um, and engaging with our communities is, the notion that like we really have to sit with some of the challenges for the while rather than and invite other people in. So it's not a matter of us pushing out a press release that says, to your point earlier, yeah. like, hey, Deloitte has decided to do X, Y, and Z. It's like, no, here's a coalition that we're building around specific issues because these challenges are incredibly varied and, and it's really important to bring the right different tools to the particular challenge that we're trying to address. Great, thank you. So as I knew it would, the Deloitte commitment is getting a lot of attention on the iPad. So Kwesi, <laughs> could you tell us a little bit more about Deloitte's commitment, mm -hmm. including um, how Deloitte's making decisions about where to focus, what to do, and measuring impact on that front? Of course. and. So what we decided is that we wanted to focus on three specific areas. Like we spent a while studying the issue of what's most impactful 
from the standpoint of the skills that we could bring and simultaneously what we've seen play out over the course of the pandemic and if you just think of long-term inequities. So we decided to focus on three distinct areas, education and workforce development, which is just core to who we are. We hire tens of thousands of people on an annual basis and just being able to expand that pool and provide pathways for people, um, for family sustaining careers was really critical. The second area that we've been focused on is health equity. And, and health equity has been interesting, right? Because if you think about, we launched the Health Equity Institute about 18 months ago, and we've really been focused on a few different things. And what we discovered, which is different than what we did in the past, is like half of that, you know, or excuse me, a third of that team's time should be focused on dealing on whatever is the pressing health issue within a community today. And we historically would have never planned that way. And then the last place is like financial inclusion. Um, just thinking about how do you lean in on helping us to bring our clients and our capabilities to reducing the racial wealth gap. And so those have been like the primary areas. The leader who's driving so much of that for me is in fact Carrie. <laughs> so the, the, item, the items associated with where we're focused is like, what are the skill sets that we bring? We convene people well, we're great with research and analytics, we're great with bringing services in addition to funding such that we can surround an organization and do some really impactful things. But it has to be a series of items, particularly items that are, that we're addressing a root cause or that we can use our scale to help other people like really surround a particular challenge in and of itself. So there's a variety of different things that we're looking to evaluate kind of the investments themselves. And I'm incredibly lucky to have Kira and her colleagues be the people who are helping me think through how we vet and how we move forward with the, um, the commitments that we'll make in the future. Great. Anything you wanted to add? Since no, you're the that's there? it. It does it well. It's a great <laughs> honor to do it, and it's uh, it's both a challenge from the portfolio standpoint, as you said, and and having both the flexibility to look at the national level and local community level are, are, are things we're trying to balance as we move forward as well. So a great question here about like talking about getting it real, get you know get real on this is both understanding how complex it is to change in Deloitte and wanting to understand what it's like for these entrepreneurs talking about what are the actual teams of people doing as they support the entrepreneurs and the the part of the question for Deloitte is how do how do project teams what are they up against and facing as they try to do this work in Deloitte mm -hmm. that isn't part of necessarily the mainstream business do you want to start again? Yeah, shoot. I'll start in terms I, of we're just going to keep with you. Start. See, he says things that are insightful. <laughs> and we can follow. Out, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right, so it, it really varies by uh, entrepreneur and where they're at with their business. So they could be working on a market entry strategy. Um, and they'll work with a senior consultant who has a team of uh, really eager analysts. Um, to be honest, we have been often told that this is um, the best project that folks have worked on Deloitte. We probably don't want to say that too loudly, but people get really excited about this kind of work because they're be able to use, they're able to flex um, the muscles that are developed as consultants on a really important problem. Um, and so the amount of commitment that we get from the consultants is really high, um, and the entrepreneurs um, often you know will prioritize something they just can't from a time perspective, don't have the time to do. And that's why we get a lot of sort of market entry research really focused on, you know, can you help me create my deal room so that I'm ready for uh, when that investor knocks on the door. Um, and I think something that we've learned uh, on both sides how to do better is to pivot with the entrepreneurs. Uh, that's sure. not um, not something that I think a muscle that was as, as developed before on, on either side, uh, but realize that things change within a minute for entrepreneurs. And so being able to have that flexibility uh, and knowing that a deliverable um, that you that you may have worked on yesterday is not going to be relevant <laughs> anymore for the entrepreneur, yeah. which I think is a valuable skill for an, at yes, any point in life, but us. also for client work. <laughs> uh, but that's a little bit of sort of the nitty gritty of the experience. Yeah, and I think the challenge within for project teams that are trying to support social entrepreneurs or nonprofits more broadly within the firm, it, it falls into a couple categories, right? Because your point is like spot on. Like you see our people who are working with some of these organizations and they're just like, this is the coolest thing I've ever done in my entire career. And and for me, that's people finding their purpose. They're taking their skill set that gives them energy. They're finding a cause that really matters to them. And they're seeing impact on a daily basis. Like they see 
I do something with this organization, and they implemented it. It wasn't, let me run this by my boss, and then put it in front of the board, and see what the board comes back to, and I'll talk to you in two years if we didn't do it. Right, and so that notion of being able to see that in real time and having that play out, that's the challenge that we have with respect to people who are engaging on these projects. Because if you look at like our entire pro bono portfolio, it's collectively, like I just said, our US firm is 150,000 people. It's probably at any given point in time, if you add everything up, probably 150 to 200 people who are working on pro bono projects. That's just not at a scale that I would really think is able to, to be as impactful as we would want to within our communities. And that's one of the things that we're really focused on for moving forward so that we can drive impact with broader organizations and produce more interactions with our people with some of these organizations because not as many of them are having that positive impact or that positive experience as I would like. Yeah, and I will say that one of the things, talk about mechanical, that I think Deloitte has done well is match up some of our processes for these so that as a practitioner, I don't have to worry about being on a pro bono project versus a client project. Exactly. That, that's treated as one of the same. Yeah. So at least there's, a, 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 there's no barrier to participate in those things. Yeah, I just think the barrier is just more opportunity, right? Like if I, if I sat back and I look at all the people who would want to work with some of these organizations, they're just the number of people who've worked with Halcyon through the years, right? Like, we're talking about thousands of people now, it's not like 50, yeah. right? Like, who have done it and come, like, if we had that opportunity and more of those and, it, and were able to accommodate more of that, it would truly be exponential. And that's really one of the things that we're working on now is how do we build in opportunities at a broader scale for people to engage in a way that is really meaningful for them. So maybe a harder question here that I just got from the crowd is, is talking about how often cultures reject things just out of history. So wanting to hear from both of you all on when something, we were talking about this earlier, the no, when you get the no and, and in what instance that was and how you guys have experienced that in this impact journey. Well, I, it was actually at Deloitte. Um, <laughs> and, I, and this is a, a great evolution, I think, of the company. Pro bono at, you know, at one point was kind of a one and done thing. And so we did this great thing for a year. Halcyon was a startup itself, we were working with startups. And then we had to pitch it again. And people were like, well, we don't do that. We, we already did, we already worked with them once. Um, and we kind of worked creatively. And it was actually really um, to the credit of, of Dan Helfrich, who was leading the, the group we were in at the time. Um, who I believe is now the CEO of the firm that says, no, actually, this is something that's beneficial. We'll try it out again. We'll try it again. Um, and then the third year came, and we, we pitched it again, and we changed slightly the, the value proposition. <laughs> and then I think there was also at the same time the firm recognizing that pro bono wasn't just this kind of one-off thing. Um, it was actually something that was creating value for retention. It was creating a lot of skill development. You saw the people who are working with us actually go on. Um, you know, one of the folks who currently manages the relationship was an analyst when mm. I started, and now he's a manager. Um, and so I think the value was seen on both sides, and I think that helped with as the firm was evolving and thinking about pro bono skills-based volunteering and how purpose as more broadly um, that we were able to grow with it. And so that no actually changed um, into a no and that we were actually able to do something really, uh, really cool. Um, and that was very different um, than what had ever been done before. Yeah, I, I do end up saying no a lot, right? <laughs> and, and it's generally driven by just helping people understand. I mean, we're just at a, such a unique point with respect to like the state of society where you have people who leave the virtual walls of the firm, which they feel are like relatively orderly, makes them feel safe and included. And then they go about their ordinary, their hopefully extraordinary lives. <laughs> and they just realize that there's just all these things that are wrong within the world that are personal to them. That they then want to come and have the firm focus on. And having to explain to people, like we need to focus on things that we can impact. Like, I fundamentally can't impact, right, quite a few things floating around, well, a lot of things. A lot of things. <laughs> right, and so helping people to understand that, yes, we are the largest professional services firm on the planet, but we can't influence wars, right, and things of that nature is a real challenge. So 
there's pretty frequent um, no's um, and like reminders of people of what's on strategy. The other thing that it's, you know, I have heard no less from my broader leadership team um, and actually pretty infrequently because we've been very thoughtful on as we think about our portfolio, we need to have everybody see themselves as being part of it. And as long as people can identify with something within that portfolio meaningful to them that they care about, which is how we landed on the three um, priority areas with our investment, it's been pretty key for moving forward. So that's always you know, one of my criteria with respect to what we invest in. Our people just need to see themselves in it in a way that's like a pretty broad scale for us to be able to move forward. And as long as we stick to that, like as one of our criteria, we generally do all right with respect to getting to yes on a lot of things. Great, and a related question for both of you all, and then we'll go from negative to positive, <laughs> is uh, what's an obstacle that you both have overcome in the last year that you didn't expect? It's good you got them thinking. <laughs> yeah. There are so many things that I didn't expect uh, in moving from Fortune 500 to to non nonprofit. Um, I think it's honestly just being flexible with um, the journey of our entrepreneurs. Right? Um, there's so much that's changed in people's lives, um, even just in these ten months that I've observed. People having health issues, and you know, something I should have mentioned is that we have. A residential program so part of our program people actually come and live and work with us um, which is pretty unique um, and being able to say okay we had this policy it didn't really make sense this person has this, this health challenge has a, a, ch a challenge with child care how do we change ourselves um, to to meet the needs of the entrepreneurs and there's just been so many such a diversity in those challenges particularly when you're working with entrepreneurs who are not coming from backgrounds where they've got tons of support or tons of capital that's backing them up. Um, so yeah, that's, it's, I know that we've fully overcome it yet, but it's something that we're continually trying to like, how do we actually meet entrepreneurs where they're at and how do we adjust ourselves to, to be the best place for them? Yeah. And my thinking was like trying not to say something abundantly obvious. <laughs> it, it's hard to change a 175 yes. year old firm. A little bit. Right? <laughs> so the whole notion of being able to say like, hey, we've got these great ideas. I know we've been doing these a certain way, like we're gonna start pivoting, and oh, by the way, we're gonna do X, Y, and Z. And even people being fully supportive, like that ship does not move easily. And, and, and I thought I was charming enough to have a good quicker, <laughs> but I'm not, right? And so I think the notion of just like organizational, not bureaucracy, but just process and protocol is real and it's there for a reason. So trying to do something new is just um, substantially harder than I would have ever imagined. Yeah. The good news is the process is there once we get it going, right? Right. Like it will uptake exactly. for sure. The machine will take it for yeah. sure. So the, uh, we have a, about five minutes left to be, at the end of the day, be conscious of that time. And I promise we'll, we will end on a positive. So several people have asked for you all to share kind of some bright spots. What have you seen that is most um, hopeful, gives you the most hope in either specific projects or in your own journey? Like what are the things that give you hope in uh, all of this? At the end of the day, I have the best job in that I'm working with entrepreneurs who are trying to change the world on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and so everything from aquatic farming in Jamaica um, as a response to, to climate change, um, sort of the focus on restoration there to uh, building assistive technology for folks with uh, low vision. Those are all issues that I'm um, being confronted with every day and realizing how much I don't, don't know. Um, but that education has been amazing because it just means that we are actually supporting folks who are doing things that have never been tried. And that is absolutely the positive. Um, and that we've got such an amazing community that is really just doing everything they can to make sure that the folks that come through our doors are being supported. That for me, I, I said this um, at one of our recent showcases, that's the cure for all the cynicism. Mm. Um, that, and cynicism is an, is an easy place for me to be, I'm a New Yorker, <laughs> um, so that's kind of a, the, the way I grew up. Um, but really, the, those entrepreneurs are absolutely the cure for that because they are just, they've got the incredible, whether it's uh, opt optimism or delusion, sometimes it's both, um, but it's fantastic and that's what that, 
that's what gives me hope. That's great. We should all have a dose of that every morning. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's fascinating because I'm my chief of staff is here somewhere. I'm eternally hopeful, but she frequently points out that I'm still grumpy, though. Which, <laughs> so, it's a good um, balance. But like, you know, I am so hopeful when we meet, you know, some of the people that are just doing things that are just so phenomenal, right? Like, and like, I've left meetings and I'm just like, I kind of love that person, yeah. right? Like, they're just doing some amazing things. Um, the other thing that was just really uh, amazing for me was, in fact, our 10-year aspiration, right? Like, scratched that out on a napkin while sitting at a bar like a, a year ago and I don't know I think I had like five free minutes and I'm just like we have to do something to galvanize our people and show them that we're showing up in a different way and work on these challenges in a different way and I think collectively I had like a five minute conversation with our CEO and then a 10 minute conversation with his executive team and it was you know it was kind of like they all stared at me and they're like okay, why don't you do it faster, mm. right? And so that was just a fundamental bright spot for me that knowing that continuing to put forward bold ideas, continuing to try to influence, you know, our impact and it being so tightly tied to our business strategy that things just became more of no-brainers rather than like an uphill push. Mm. That's great. And it, it takes us almost full circle back to where we started about how many of the trends that were in motion have just been hyper accelerated. And that's the thing that makes me the most hopeful is that both comments, there's the entrepreneurs more than ever have support to bring forward those great ideas. And, and the promise of Deloitte on the platform that we have at Deloitte to really advance in a social change in a way that we just wouldn't have even thought about talking about at, um, in large corporations five years ago. So with that, we have lots of work to do.